Thanks, Anna. And thank you for everyone here. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, my name is Sophie Strand. I am a writer. Um, I am a storyteller interested in the intersection between spirituality and myth and ecology. Um, I have some books coming out. And today I have um, a long, you know, a long talk that I can give with some exercises. But I think that, you know, I think real learning is conversational and it's interruptive and we all risk being changed. So don't hesitate to interrupt. Um, I may not be looking at the chat, so if you want to unmute yourself and, and begin to speak and ask a question, you know, we're not trying to complete something. We're not trying to get to a goal. We're being recursive and involuted. We're just trying to map where we are right now. So don't hesitate to um, slow this down and to dilate something. Um, I would love if you would be, if you would do that. Okay. So. I just want to start this by acknowledging that while we have been flattened into these little digital squares and into human faces, we are actually more than human. We are teeming collaborative ecosystems of being all gathering here today in this virtual container. We are weaving our roots of relation into something else, something tentacular. And we might want to risk losing ourselves to contribute to a bigger version of a body. Mm a plushier, pricklier version of aliveness. We are all relational beings. Um, Stephanie, I think, or hmm, someone's creating a lot of noise. I'm just trying to see who that is. Um, and while we're all gathered here today, we are all fruitings of very specific assemblages of beings and specific stories and specific ecosystems. And if you want to take a breath and just notice Two smells, two textures, two tastes that come to mind that inhabit where you are, um, two sounds. Something I like to do is to stop trying to read my surroundings in a um, alphabetic way, trying to accumulate and get information about how best to um, navigate. I sometimes like to sink back into my senses and just see what little portals are being opened. Um, and I think that if we begin to map our sensory worlds a little bit more, create smellscapes of the landscape, biophonic um, collaborations, sometimes we can notice things that we wouldn't if we were just going about our days in this kind of linear, um, progress oriented way. Okay. So the way I want to start ecological storytelling is with a practice. And this is a practice that informs my work and orients it and also blesses it. It's what I do every morning. It's also what I do before I enter into projects, before I begin to write, before I begin to speak, before I begin to think. Um, I love John O'Donohue's idea of a benediction as opening up a rhizomatic vein where the blessings flow both ways. It's a way of acknowledging and opening up the lymphatic pulse of blessings. Um, so this is my version of that. And I call it gathering council. I try to summon every being in a 20 mile radius of my home by name. I'm not talking about taxonomical Linnaean classification by whatever nickname, noise, phrase, color um, that denotes intimacy. I summon for me personally, the limestone, the glacial moraine, the Muncie Lenape people of the Hudson Valley where I live, the pileated woodpecker, the mountain lion, the scarlet tanager and honey fungi, the Esophis Creek and the woodchuck. And by the time I'm done, it can sometimes be an hour long. But you know, there are no rules about this. Sometimes it's 10 minutes. It's just the, the, the beings that I'm feeling most connected to that day. And sometimes it's a whole polyphony of discordant, sometimes melodious braiding um, voices and songs. Um, by the end of it, I'm surrounded by a world of witnesses, a web work of my extended being and mind. The day begins with the acknowledgement that none of my decisions happen in a vacuum. They are inextricably born from and tied to many, many other species. 
and my decisions and my work and my storytelling henceforth will be made with the knowledge that I exist relationally. Everything I do is ecological. When I use the word ecological, I root back to the original etymology, Greek oikos, for household. I am not a noun on an empty page. I do nothing alone. I am a syntactical being strung together by my metabolism and needs and desires to thousands of other beings. And together, we are all a household, a particular household with particular needs and particular stories that don't necessarily extend to other countries and other counties and other people. There's a very unique um, system that I'm a part of. And every choice I make capillaries out into that network household of relationships. I like this because as we feel ourselves flanked by our allies and feel them actually co-creating our very bodies by virtue of how we metabolically loop, uh, loop with every breath, you know, tens pores in every breath, pheromones, hormones, the microbiome of the soil. Um, I like that we, we, our allies are actually creating our bodies and they actually show up. Um, these are not like the gods that don't have meat and funk and smell that are always in the sky. These are the helpers that are here and will actually swoop down. The heron will show up at a crucial moment when you need advice. The tree will push back on you as you need support, as you need something to reaffirm your body. Um, so there's, there's something very tactile and real about acknowledging these, re these relationships because they are actually materially present inside your lived day-to-day -day life. Um, they are attached to place. And the more you summon them, the more they will show you that there is a miracle in every one of your footsteps and a deep abiding embrace in every biome-laced breath you take. Um, if you pray, ask yourself, does your prayer have roots? Does your God sometimes grow fur? Do your holy words sprout leaves? Does your spirituality or your practice connect you into your situated ecosystem? Um, seek out new relationships to further flesh out this relational prayer if you want. Gather counsel as you would wildflowers. Pick the ones that show up brightly, insistently, and show you that they notice you just as much as you notice them. Gather counsel as you would pick up a few flat stones to skip across the river. Gather counsel as you would stars without your hands, held only as a flash of light in the prismatic blink of an open eye. So I want to ask now with this idea of gathering counsel, if we could all bring one of our beings into this actual space. And I, you know, I'm an animist, which is that I do inherently believe that there is a kind of experience that every particle, every electron, every being is having. <laughs> um, and I, I think that we sometimes demonize the internet, but the internet is created by the minerals and the carbon of nature. The internet is nature. However, it might be important to help it sprout. And as we are living within this digital space, I'm wondering if you could write in the chat or unmute yourself and share, weave in one being who you've seen today or who has come to you in your dreams, who you've tasted, who you smelled. And if that's hard, and if that's not quite enough of a prompt, I also want to say that I've been thinking of quarantine as being a container for certain types of more than human experiences that wouldn't show up in the loud anthropogenic noise of daily life. Oh, we have cat in the woods, we have mud, we have eastern hemlock and crow and snowflakes. We had a huge blizzard here this morning and now there's blue sapphire sky. Natural gas, yeah, rose, maple who stands outside my window, silkworm cocoon, my neighbor's tree, cormorant, nuthatch, heron, hummingbird, the kind who turns pink when they drink. I love hummingbirds because they almost seem to spend matter. They're this amazing way where you can immediately see how matter like flows through a doorway that we're all silhouettes from, from moving matter. We're not, we're patterns more than we are concrete individuals. Okay, an amazing bird in Sri Lanka that I don't know the name of, bright blue streak, rhododendron. Mm. I'm gonna bring the seagulls who I've decided are actually some of the most agile flyers. I live by a river and I watch them every day. 
And I've been thinking that they have a lot to teach us in this moment of climatological change and social chaos and war about adaptive movement, about not planning, but immediately improvising our flight and our dance work with the wind as it comes. That if we watch them, we might learn something about intellectual and physical flexibility and spontaneous improvisation. Earth, Gaia. Okay. So I wanna know if anybody has a story about a more than human mentorship. Because you know, I think that we, we've outsourced our intuition for a really long time to human gurus and um, teachers. But the truth is that in many different cultures for many thousands of years, it was known that animals and fungi and insects and plants might provide very serious dreams and mentorship. I mean, personally, at the start of quarantine, I had woodchucks start showing up in my life and I didn't think they were sexy enough to be a teacher. I didn't know that they would have information for me. And yet they showed up so insistently and so loudly. They would run at me. They would like nip at me. I had to get rabies shots actually because I had such a close encounter with one. Um, ooh, we have baby rabbits born in our garden last week. Oh, that's nice. That makes me feel like spring is coming. And slowly I began to realize that I was being taught by an animal. And it wasn't the animal I would have chosen. It was the animal that chose me. And I'm wondering that if in this strange container where the volume has been turned down on human sound and um, the human speed of, of life, if anyone else has had a non-human, more than human mentor and wants to share. Okay, let me give it one more second. And if you have one, you can speak up. A beloved relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I can go. Um, sorry, I'm in bed because it's like two o'clock in the morning here. Um, but I have been learning a lot about my work in campaigning um, through trees and actually started more intellectually than kind of feeling it um, because I live in London and we have trees, but it's not natural to connect um, with, with nature like I'm a city girl. Um, but I, I read a book about the hidden life of trees in the forest, probably, you know? um, but it was really beautifully talking about the analogy of how, how trees are all interconnected and how you know, a tree is a component of a forest um, and not its own individual thing and what we can learn um, from that. And basically that just sparked me off on a whole journey of wanting to know how trees communicate with one another. And I used a lot of the reflections about trees and the things that I've learned um, in my work in, in campaigning um, with humans. Um, so it's, been a really yeah it's been a really crazy journey as let me thanks um yeah i think trees and mycorrhizal fungi have a lot to teach us about how a self flows well past a species and well past a self um and how that supercellular state which is what they call it when fungi when nuclei actually move through cells they don't have um closed cells their cells are open so nuclei can and energy and minerals can flow through um how perhaps opening ourselves up to a supercellular state um into a much more porous interrogative relationship with all of the beings around us might make us more interesting activists and writers and thinkers because suddenly our ideas aren't um unfortunately constrained to what I call the narrative dysbiosis of colonial capitalism. <laughs> um, I oftentimes think of the narrative um, scarcity we experience as being a little bit like our antibiotic culture, which is that um, we, we think we can clean everything up. We think that everything is a process of pur purification or negation. And even our conservation attempts are about managing ecosystems, about maintaining the fiction of a climactic ecosystem. Even though the fact that ecosystems are always changing, trees are migrating, fungi are coming with them, um, things are always in process. And um, I, you know, our antibiotic culture is also focused on our guts. 
that we think that we can kill off all the pathogens again and again and kill off all the good bacteria and create a healthy ecosystem. But what really happens is that we leave this barren ravaged gut with too much cultural gut biome real estate. And so that a, narr um, a narrative, a monologuing pa narrative pathogen can take over like um, patriarchal capitalism <laughs> um, because it doesn't have enough stuff to keep it in check. And the issue is that we can't kill the stuff off with a fungicide. We can't go in and continue the same deranged thinking of extraction and purification. We have to take a probiotic. We have to add in more stories. And so I think thinking with other species in spaces where other species usually aren't allowed is a way of adding a probiotic to an antibiotic culture. Um, that we can practice a kind of kaleidoscopic empathy in these moments where we, like I sometimes have, have said like, okay, if you're gonna clear cut a forest, what if you had to do a year long inventory of its effect on every single species in the forest? You, and, so you, and then you had to gather a council where people represented every being and everyone went through how those beings would be affected. And everyone went through the experience of how this, of what it would be like to have that forest cut down. And then at the end, the loggers could decide to go in and cut it down. Um, I mean, this is totally fictional and it's very precious idea, but I wish that we had that kind of patience and that kind of empathic muscularity. Um, and I think it's something that we can embody in our own lives and hope that it in some way resonates with other people. Um, okay, someone else added rocky beaches of Nova Scotia, always changing. Yeah, I've always wanted to go to Nova Scotia. My parents almost moved there. Um, okay. I was, I thought of my, I adopted a dog during mm -hmm. the pandemic, a puppy, and I had never like really interacted or been um, with a dog that was like aggressive and really two other people really like very protective of my family, but I would trust this dog is incredibly loving and like the perfect family dog. So is this like experience with this other way of being, where being like incredibly protective outside and like having a really hard boundary and then incredibly soft on the inside. And that's just been an interesting thing to witness and learn from. I thought of that in response to your question. Mm, I like that. Yeah. I mean, I think as a trauma survivor, you know, I didn't trust human beings afterwards. I was a small child, but I did trust animals and plants. And I, I think that there are the, the world that extends beyond the human is, you know, it's not good or bad. It's just a lot more. And there's a lot more place for you to land with all of your shit. Um, and sometimes I like to offer to people that, you know, we're so extractive that we never think that we could be the medicine. Um, and what would it look like if you thought of yourself as like an acupuncture needle in the land or in the web of relations that you're actually with your footstep activating miles and miles of mycelial fungi, you're sending messages. The land is calling you in. And so I think that these relations, um, if we are, if we flip the paradigm a little bit, we can think of ourselves as being medicinal too in these relationships um, and pay attention to where our ecological niche might be. Um, and I think the way we tap into this intuition is not intellectual. So really paying attention to the smells and the touches, the shades of light, the gradients and temperature that we feel ourselves drawn to. Um, and, you know, this doesn't happen fast. All of this stuff is, is phototropically slow. Like it's like a plant slowly orienting towards the sun in an adjacent possible. Like you have to just really slow down so that you can begin to take in stories and information that don't come to you as language. I mean, you know, in the conversation that I had earlier this morning with Bio, Bio was talking about how language is probably not an inherently human faculty. It's more a territory that we're inside of and um, that we can be a channel for. And I think that those languages are sometimes pheromones and their sense and their heart feelings. And that sometimes the best stories come to us as um, a somatic intuition. And we might need to learn how to be better readers. Yeah, which I think kind of brings me to the most important aspect of ecological storytelling is actually not active. It's not about telling stories. Like I'll go through a list of ways we can actually write ecological stories in a second. 
because I do think that's a very interesting exercise. But I do think that the most important part of ecological storytelling is listening and learning how to ask for stories and be the mouthpiece, the channel for stories that don't have a voice right now. Um, who here has read Wolfram van Eschenbach's Parseval? Has anyone? Or has read any of the Grail stories? Okay. Um, I was a medievalist in college, so I get a little nerdy about these things. I loved Arthurian myths and then I went way deeper. Um, so this is one of, oh, Maria, hello. Hello, Maria, do you want to say something? Hi, I just jumped in. I don't know where you're at. Sorry, I was in another session that was going a little long. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Um, I'm going to go back to the grail. <laughs> um, well, one of the most famous Arthurian legends is of the grail, the holy grail, which is kind of like this magical object that orients the quest. That's like a magnet that creates narrative propulsion in these romance stories. It takes the, the hero and throws them into the forest and throws this into them into this very individualistic, penetrative um, Darwinian thrust. Um, and in one of the very weirder versions of that story is me. hello I think we have a little kid hello no oh nope um and his name is Parsival and as he goes out on his quest he unfortunately follows the rules of being a knight the chivalric rules too closely and when he's following the rules the human rules inside a much more than human world because he enters the forest into like these stereomorphic animal gods people with gems for heads he very much exits the human world and yet he's still very much devoted to human rules and this is this does not serve him well in his search for the grail because the grail is outside the boundaries of the city outside the boundaries of the human and the first time he's invited to the sacred grail castle there's a wounded king and Fortas. And instead of slowing down and assessing the situation, Parseval kind of blindly goes through the whole experience as this blundering hero and gets thrown out. And it isn't until the very end of the story and his second return to the Grail castle that he realizes that the way to get the Grail is to abandon the hero's journey and to turn to the wounded king and to say, what ails thee? And for me, the way out of a monologic story is by asking for another story. And the way out of our um, narrative, narratively impoverished culture is by learning to ask and listen for other stories. Um, we've created quite a lot of pain and it might be important to actually turn up the volume on that agony. I mean, I sometimes say to people, you know, people always ask me, what is eco-awakening? How can I become eco-awake? Um, how can I become more environmentally aware? I want to say, this is not a pleasurable thing. It's, it's not a bad thing, but it's not an easy thing. It's like when your leg has been asleep and it prickles back awake and it is painful. You know, we have, every time we've shot an arrow, it's ended up in our own breast through by virtue of the web of relations that we are part of, but ignore. And when you really start waking up to all of those different voices and how much pain you've caused, you're gonna feel a lot of agony. Um, but I do think that these moments of pressure, these moments of pain can have information for us about what needs our attention. And I think, an interesting personal anecdote to offer is I have a genetic condition and it was undiagnosable for a long time. And during that time, I was very in love with fungi for many years, amateur mycophile. And I was finally diagnosed with a connective tissue disease right at the moment that I realized that fungi are the connective tissue of the soil and of ecosystems. And I realized that while my condition was incurable, 
while my, the way my body was mirroring the pain of the ecosystem was not um, manageable <laughs> within a human narrative, I could flip it and pour myself into the narrative of the connective tissue of the soil that was similarly suffering, but could, if nourished, if paid attention to store carbon, bring back biodiverse ecosystems, provide medicines and information we can't even begin to quantify. Um, and so something I wanna to offer to people is where do your personal woundings, psychological, traumatic, personal, physical, where do they show you the shape of something else? Where do they orient, orient you out of yourself into a, a narrative event, into a conversation with something else? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to offer anything that comes to mind. Um, I think we all have different beings that we'll provide a mouth for. Um, I think that it's important not to try and love everything. You have to love and pay attention to the thing that you are called to. Oh, I have yeah, my genetic collagen disorder. That's me too. So Linnea, nice to meet you. Hi, Aaron. Sylvia Kuskianki. Yeah, that agony is so important because people, people don't know how to stay with it. And it's there. It's, it's, the, it's the waiting room you have to pass through to wake up. And when you're not prepared for it, it can really destabilize you or paralyze you from any kind of action. Does anyone have any stories they'd like to share of realizing that what they were experiencing was in some way a compass direction towards some other awareness? I mean, I can, I can tell a little of my story. Um, I feel I talked in the last session too, so I'm aware of that, but, um, uh, so, uh, I am the mother of a, a stillborn son who died at 40 weeks, um, three and a half years ago, Raphael. Um, and, uh, that experience, even though it's very different than having, um, a degenerative illness or a disability in some ways, it, it definitely has uh, opened up a lot of different ways of seeing and being in the world. And especially like for the times that we are living in. Um, and so I had been told that I could never have children. And then a year later I got pregnant. And so it's, there's a lot like behind it too. It's not just like this, you know, I think that's the, the depth of our stories and the multi-layered nature of the narrative. Um, but I feel that Rafa gave us all, like gave the whole world, like a lot of gifts. Um, and a lot of people had a really close connection to him, even though they obviously never met him. He was never existed outside of my, my womb. And for me, the gift was one of the many uh, just shortly after he died and was born and I, and I had him, like I, I decided to have a vaginal birth because I couldn't imagine not feeling that pain. Like it was, it just inconceivable to me, the idea that they would put me under and then just give me a C-section and then it would be over. And so that was really important part was the transit labor. Um, and actually like birthing his body out of me. And, uh, a few days after that, um, it just like, I started hearing all these stories written from other people and seeing like how miscarriage and pregnancy loss and also like children who are estranged from their parents, there's so much grief around this. And it's so, there's no, there's not a lot of spaces in a grief phobic and death phobic society. Um, and I felt like Rasha was calling me to do, to hold space for collective grief. And, um, and so I think that the other narrative that came has come through this experience and it's obviously really painful and I vacillate back and forth between being a victim and, um, and, and feeling a lot of rage at like other mothers and like the narrative around what it means to be a mother. Um, I wanna like fight back against that, especially as a monolith, like, well, motherhood is like this. And you're like, well, your kids are alive. So let me tell you how motherhood is for me. There's all those different parts of me, but like deep and recently this came back again as like deep beneath the surface um, is a story about where we are as a, 
as a planet right now. And if there's anything that I can say with certainty that I feel is needed and that can come through me as a space, our spaces for, for grieving together. Um, so that's kind of, it came as like a vocation, as like a call to me to, to do this work and to hold it. Um, it's been a, a slow process, but it's coming, you know, and it just, those feelings keep coming back to me of like that clarity of the gifts that my stillborn son brought me. Thank you. That is very fierce of you to share. And I had um, a miscarriage, right? I didn't, it wasn't far along, but it was far enough along at the start of quarantine. So I, I have also been feeling like, you, do I get to call myself a mother? Like I've, I've had two pregnancies that were mi miscarriages. Like do what, what do I get to call myself? Um, I felt, you do. yeah, I felt something in me. I felt myself become more than one person. Um, I mean, something that I did, I, it's so interesting you talk about that because I really do think that these interrupted pregnancies are incredibly ecologically complex relationships. After my first miscarriage, I started to, I, in Tibetan Buddhism, there, there's a practice of between death and rebirth or 49 days in the bardo. And I did the, this practice for 49 days of every day I'd wake up and find a being in the sky and say that's you and I would imagine this child inhabiting a different being and it was this way for 49 days I mean I would like light candles and 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 inflect my own um ritual observances onto that but it was a way of me dispersing my child into my ecosystem and seeing them begin to fertilize my relationship with all of these different beings um but our culture has no space for that there's no book about it. So write your book. <laughs> no, don't. It, it's just like you're looking. I, I have, a, I've had a lot of friends have to give birth to, to stillborn babies and, and have this just like a ubiquitous experience that we do not talk about and do not hold space for. So thank you. Um, that means a lot to me today. Yeah. I'm so sorry about your, about your baby too. It happens. It, it's part of, it's a birthright. <laughs> Um, well, let's see the comments. Yeah. A lot of people are very thankful to you, Aaron. Yeah. Yeah, we do not have a lot of information about how to die and how death is actually the moment when aliveness pours over from individual aliveness into quite a lot more aliveness. You know, this deer died, speaking of ecological storytelling, and this deer was hit by a car near my house when I was growing up and it was hot, hot summer. And I would sit with it every day. I was like very upset by the experience. And what I watched is that it was, it was like one life was suddenly a billion lives that there were maggots, there were flies, there were, there were little beings coming and eating it. There were insects. And I recently was reading about how the, there are these carrion beetles that the way they mate is by finding a dead mouse. Like once, once one of them finds a dead mouse, a carrion beetle comes and then he puts his little hind legs in the air and he does a little dance and he lets go of these pheromones. Lady carrion beetle comes and then they use the mouse as their mating ground. They, mount, they, they mate on it and then they carry it and they bury it and they lay their, their babies inside of the mouse so that the, the mouse is the womb of their babies who wake up and then have food to eat. Um, so death is the womb of life. And because I love fungi and rot so much, you know, rot is the womb of life. Um, and when we don't let things rot, when we don't let ourselves rot, we create real issues. I mean, the fossil fuels that are running our country today are the product of a period of time when they're in the Cambrian era, when there was an explosion of woody matter and no fungi developed to break it down. And it actually created a climatological cooling event. It was like a, a climate crisis. And it, um, killed lots of, it, created, it was an extinction event that killed beings and it created the compacted undigested matter that is the fossil fuels that is running global warming today. So I think about when we don't let things rot, when we don't learn how to digest and eat our own shit like oyster mushrooms. I always like to say like, teach me how to eat my own shit to oyster mushrooms. <laughs> um, we create the fuel for um, very, very ecocidal narratives. Yeah. Brooklyn, I don't know if you want to share about your grandmother, but thank you for writing it in the chat. 
Um, thank you. Okay, so if no one has anything more to add, and I'm fully capable and would love if someone wants to add something else, um, I might do a little bit of a practical um, meditation on what ecological storytelling can be if you're a writer or a journalist or a, or a filmmaker. Um, so there's a quote and you may have heard it. It goes, all great literature is one of two stories. A man goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town. And it's often attributed to Leo Tolstoy. But even the ability to legitimately trace the quotation back to the man himself tells a third story, the retrocausal quest. The work claims authorship that can't be proven. The quote is deracinated from an author and most importantly from ecological context. What was it attempting to address? Russian literature, world literature, late 19th century Russian agricultural practices? What happens when the man being quoted has more bacterial cells in his body than he does human bodies? What happens when a town comes to a man, when a journey goes on a story, when a stranger comes into a body? In an age of ecological crisis and extinction, I want to propose that there are not one or two stories. Every story, like every human body, is an ecosystem of other stories. The virus that taught us mammals how to develop wombs, the ancient ecological pressures that mold us, molded us into multicellularity, our pulsing microbiome, our fungi dusted skin. Every recombinatory miracle of genetics gives birth not to an individual on a hero's journey, but to a biodiversity of competing and converging aliveness, a patchy topology of differences. If we understand that our bodies are ecologies, so should our stories represent textured, relational, sometimes ruptured ecosystems. Okay. I, I think right now it would be helpful to bring in one of my favorite writers because you know we're not all individuals. You're just as as authorship. We're compost heaps of all the thinkers we've listened to, all the things we've eaten. You know, my gut biome is probably talking to you right now. Who knows? So I just want to bring in one of my favorite writers who's inspired a lot of this thinking, who's Ursula Le Guin. And she writes about story that conflict is one kind of behavior. There are others equally important in any human life, such as relating, finding, losing, bearing, discovering, parting, changing. Change is the universal aspect of all these sources of story. Story is something moving, something happening, something or somebody changing. For me, story is movement and movement that thermodynamic slant, that gradient of fertile difference that draws matter to other matter is much, much bigger and older than human beings. Human beings did not invent stories, we arrived inside of them. We are told by geological stories with scales too large for us to even grasp. The advent of grasses, relatively recent in the history of vegetation, may be deeply wedded to our most intimate seasonal mythologies. Our myths may be grass myths, fungal myths, bacterial myths, we are infected with fungal stories through fermentation. Civilization itself may be a non-human narrative authored by fermentation yeast using humans as its characters. Our very wounds are the product of a viral incursion that taught us how to produce syncytin that produces the protective syncopoblast layer of the womb. Wombs are viral stories. Why then are we stuck in one bad story, that of colonial capitalism? Why do we tell such simple, scentless, funkless, meatless stories that do not wake children up to their birthright of kinship with every grub and ladybug and load of dust they encounter? More importantly, why do we not ask for stories? We have forgotten that stories are not just told in human language. Gregory Bateson fam famously said of information that it is the difference that makes the difference. I'd like to also apply this to a new type of narrative noticing. How do small differences in temperature and bird flight and wild clover dispersal and mildew scent register in you and change you? How does that interactivity create something, a change, a movement, a story? So we've been stuck in these hero's journeys. We've been stuck in these, relative, these kind of anemic anorexic MFA literature with like two people, no trees, no smells, and a very small arc. Instead of ecosystems with many different voices 
And, um, you know, biodiverse ecosystems are much more able to resist climatological pressures, you know, tree farms will immediately burn. <laughs> we, with our stories, we should probably begin to start weaving resilient ecosystems. And maybe if we do that, we'll start to actually benefit and value that biodiversity in our actual world. If we're always telling these kind of like tree farm hero's journey experiences, we're probably going to act like that in our day-to-day -day life. Um, so I kind of want to offer, um, some more narrative forms and and think about like so here's one of my issues like i i know the overstory was a lot of people's first ecological thing but i would argue that the overstory is this is trees as humans and women as fetishized saints or um sex objects <laughs> and that while you can have a story that's about ecological concerns it can still be a deeply human story and that the more interesting thing to do is to take humans and to pour them into ecological forms Rather than to blow your trumpet and saying, I am writing a story about a coral reef, what if you try to write the story in the mode of a coral reef? And I, I do think that, you know, not, neither is right, but one might, it hasn't been tried a lot, and it might be interesting to pour ourselves into it. Um, so what are some forms that might bend us into more interesting positions? Um, and in, if in these unusual shapes, might we see futures not visible from the vantage point of linear human time? So here are some things I've been thinking with and trying to write with, and I really practice this. I mean, I write long format historical fiction whereby the way I create the narrative is based on an organism and it underpins everything I do. I'm not saying it's successful, but I do actually try and walk the walk because I know a lot of theory can seem kind of like, you know, very blousy and, and interesting, but not actually practical. I do try and do this. I think Virginia Woolf did it. I think Virginia Woolf is one of the most fungal writers I've ever read. Everything bleeds into everything, everything in this in a supercellular state with Virginia Woolf. Um, so I think with fungi a lot, um, but if, you know, of course there are 3.8 million different types of fungi. So I'm not gonna try and generalize and say that this is a fungal, you know, the only fungal story. You know, there are 3.8 million different fungal stories. So it's important for us to always be acknowledging those differences. Um, but there are some different narratives that they give us. One is mycorrhizal fungi that 500 million years ago taught plants how to have root systems after they left the water. Um, you know, when plants first left the water, they were like puddles or tumbleweeds. And the really interesting, interesting thing about fungi is they already had rhizomatic behavior in the soil and they reached up and they taught plants how to come down into situated ecological um, relationship. And they extended the radius of the plant's ability to access minerals and food. And even to this day, even now that, um, I have read Sylvia Lindstedt's work, she's wonderful, we're connected, yeah. Um, even now to this day, most plant, 90% of plants are completely dependent on mycorrhizal fungi. And I think it would be really interesting. Um, what does it, you know, what does it mean to look at a mycorrhizal network when creating an ecosystem of characters? What if the main character of a story was interstitial rather than individual, the living connective tissue between events and places and beings rather than a hero or a discrete person? What if your main character was a relationship? a connective tissue? Or what if all of your characters were from the same underground mycelium? What if all of your characters were the same person? Um, there are all sorts of interesting ways we can play with this. There's, um, you know, lichen is also, you know, lichen is a holobind, was a collection of different beings creating another being, which is what we are actually, with more bacterial cells in our body than human cells. Um, lichen is algae and bacteria and yeast and collaborating to create a, a lichen that can produce chemicals and medicines that would never be produced with any of these separate organisms. And for me, real love stories might be lichenized. You know, what, what would it mean to pour Romeo and Juliet into a lichen form? Perhaps if we did that, it would not be a tragedy. What happens when we pour our famous tragedies into more interesting shapes? Do they change? Um, that's something I'm really interested in right now is like, we think of certain narratives as being inevitable. One, one of them that I'm interested in is we think of the story of Jesus as being foretold and happening and ending on the cross. But what if we had poured that story into a more interesting, more than human shape? So I'm, I'm always interested in the kind of healing that is through um, shape shifting, you know, 
when we, we, we look at older myths, my favorite is the story of the bard Taliesin and then Merlin, which is, you know, I was a salmon. I was a loaf of bread. I was a gra piece of grass. I was a bear. Um, that to become a storyteller, to become a prophet, you have to inhabit these other shapes and learn how to take them. And I think that it's interesting when you're thinking about writing a story to see how it would look in different shapes. You wanna write a love story? Well, how would it look like in a gregarity of swarming locusts? Well, how, how would it happen if you put it inside the behavior where crickets go through this morphological change and become very social and then become a plague and eat crops and swarm and devastate landscapes? What, what if you poured a love story into that? What if you poured a love story into a butterfly, a caterpillar who, when it goes into the chrysalis melts, completely melts. And yet when it reconstitutes on the other side, retains memories of being a caterpillar, retains scent memories that it associates with bad experiences. What does it mean to think about something being melted and its mind actually being destroyed and then being reconstituted? Um, I get very excited, obviously, because there's so, there's so many beings in our world and there's so many better stories. Um, sorry, I clicked a button by accident. Here we go. Um, yeah. One that I think about a lot is mycoheterotrophy, which is when a plant stops photosynthesizing and completely parasitically attaches to a fungi below ground and gets all of its food from the fungi. And in our very anth anthropocentric narratives, we say that this, is, this never benefits um the fungi that the, the fungi couldn't enjoy this that this you know but we're only using quantitative analysis and i actually think that mycoheterotrophy can be a really helpful frame for disability narratives for chronic and terminal illness narratives narratives um many believe there is something qualitative and mysterious happening between the two that queers our idea of a transactional relationship what could a relationship look like between characters that was based on mycoheterotrophy what if a character was a mycoheterotrope with a landscape or with another person? Um, you know, we have very simplistic pop psychology ideas of codependence, but if we actually look at nature, everything is pretty goddamn codependent. Um, and it might be interesting to think about how to do that better. You know, so we can also take psychology and pour it into more interesting shapes. Um, Whenever I have an abstract idea, I want to ask where its roots are. Where does it keep its brain if its brains are its root system? So whenever you tell me something is tr something is good, is bad, is toxic, I'm like, okay, how is it toxic to the ecosystem? Explain it to me. Explain me its scent, its funk. Um, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, there's some other plots I've been thinking about. Um, I've been thinking about cell apoptosis, when cells learn, like have self-programmed um, death. Um, I've been thinking about invasive species a lot and how actually invasive species have been problematized in conservation um, efforts in a way that is really simplistic and harmful to ecosystems ultimately. But in, in, every species has at some point been an invasive species. And sometimes they come in on time scales that are so much wider than the human and are doing ecological management we can't understand. That they come in as the nursemaids to climatological pressures we've caused. You know, they say, all right, you know, so it's a lot rainier and more humid here. And these shallow rooted trees are not long for this world. But if they all come down with windstorms, it's not gonna be good. What if we as mustard greens, as an invasive species, killed off slowly in a managed way, these um, trees that are no longer ecologically adapted to this place and created more space for novelty. Um, so I think that it's interesting when we're using ecological storytelling is also using it as like a conservation model of a way of expanding our scalar view of ecosystems. Um, humans are the ultimate invasive species. Um, not really. Um, I think the human is a virus thing or human is the invasive, well, you know, everything's an invasive species. We're not the most invasive species. We are the species that's learned how to eat everything. And that is an interesting thing. We are the species that's learned how to get every calorie out of every single thing. Most species are only adapted to eating a couple of different things. We have learned how to eat everything. When It's kind of like King Midas. When you turn everything into food, you kind of erase its ability to tell you a story. And sometimes I think about so many of these um, 
food sensitivities that people are having, I mean, I can barely eat anything. And I'm not saying that these are good things, but I also think that they're a way of our environment saying like, you can't eat everything. You can't extract every calorie. Um, yeah, it depends which humans, capitalism is, is, here's the thing, I don't even want to call capitalism an invasive species. I want to call it a monologuing pathogen in a ravaged gut. I want to call it, yeah, a yeast, a candida. Um, even though I love fungi, it kind of behaves like a candida in, a, in a, an embattled immune system that can't quite fight it off. And so the way that you handle those bad pathogens, those you know, imperial capitalist desires is not by killing them off, but by strengthening the immune system with adaptogenic stories and adding in probiotics. Okay, let's see. So we have 10 minutes to go and I have so much more that I, could. oh yeah, talk. Eileen, come in and say something. You have your hand up. Hey, um, I just thought I'd, I find myself musing a lot of like, how can we practice this more? day to day how can we be I mean there's metaphor but there's also yeah like so much around language <clears throat> and this I was just thinking how there's so much capitalistic language or like equating like nature to goods and like there's so much energy pulling nature that way or you know the natural world all other beings like into this mindset of like quantitative extraction <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, just like I'm, I'm feeling myself um, pulled to be an agent of the, the inverse or like, you know, how can we bring the ecological um, language, metaphor, storytelling and like convert practices like the systematized things into that language and like what will that do? And I'm just trying to like name for myself in my mind, like moments when that might arise and when I could practice that. So thank you for inspiring this. I love that. Yeah. I mean, I think Adrienne Marie Brown has done such a great job of, of saying like, look, these are forms we can apply to activism. Like there, there are translations that are possible that we can do in our practice. I've, I'm a writer. So the translation I've done is how do I apply this to my writing? How do I make I root my writing in an actual place? Um, but I think that there are people, you know, farmers have a very practical understanding of this. You know, there are, there are translations where, where the distance is, it, it's like from one dialect of, Fran of French to another dialect of French. But then there are ones where the gulf is almost insurmountable. You know, it's like when we get old Greek on Crete and we don't even have anything to base it on. We, we can't even decipher it. And I think sometimes with systems, it's about saying, can this system be translated or must it be digested from the outside by ivy? And I think sometimes things don't want to be translated. They need to be digested. Hmm. Um, sometimes you got to put an oyster mushroom on them um, and, and see if it can learn how to eat shit. Um, so sometimes it's not translation. I think sometimes it, it's, you know, metabolically breaking it down, um, at least in my own life. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, does anyone else have anything they want to share on that note, on that long stream of information I shared? Um, if not, I'll end with a practice that helps me. That um, this is something that, to be perfectly honest, um, as a sort of teach White's the Once and Future King, the character of Merlin says to the little prince. Um, little um, King Arthur and says, Anna, do you want to say something? Oh. Um, he says, you know, the only cure for being sad is to learn something. And for me, the past two years have been really, really difficult. And before that, there have been other very hard times. And the way through them has not been by focusing on myself, but by trying to pour myself into other beings. And it is by inhabiting those shapes that I have survived quite practically. It's not learning in the sense of acquiring or accumulating knowledge. It's learning in building relationship and kinship. And so there's a way I do this that is pretty practical and I wanna share it, which is, I call it species lunation. Whether you track them or not, the year contains 
I'm going to say 12 moon cycles, but it's really almost close to 13. So this is this is simplified. Nothing actually breaks down to our our you know our numerical system. So, the, so that's part of the, the lesson is that nothing can be simplified. But I'm going to say 12 for now. But you can have it be 13. 12 times a year, the oceans swell and recede, and your own body, 73% water, also responds tidally. As recently as 2000 years ago, cultures were still oriented towards lunar cycles and cyclical time more generally. The linear rays of the sun had yet to completely monopolize our ability to think temporalities. And while patriarchal capitalism has conflated femininity with the moon, lunacy with madness and cyclical thinking as opposed to the progress of science, the moon used to belong to everyone. In Crete, there were lunar bull gods. The horned gods of Europe were associated with crescent moons and lunar cycles through their bull horns. Osiris is chopped into 14 pieces by his murderous brother Set, a fact that scholars have used to argue he is a lunar god associated with the 14 waning days of the moon. Jesus was a Jew seeking to reform Judaism, and lest we forget, Judaism, Judaism is a religion that uses the moon as its calendrical compass. Jesus is only abstracted from his role as a lunar god when his body is removed from the tomb and he ascends out of cyclical time. Almost any god that dies back composts into the soil with his body, then returns, mirrors the changeability of the moon. Lunar masculinities were allowed to be mutable. Lunar femininities were allowed to be mutable. They were allowed to flicker and flow. They encouraged the respect for cycles, both spiritual and natural. Each moon cycle was a bowl where you could mix and change and explore different modes of consciousness. So I wanna offer lunar wisdom. And lunar wisdom is that even on a new moon night, the moon is still present, replete and whole, while also void and occluded. This is a completion that holds loss tenderly inside its body. The moon is kinetic. It invites you to dissolve your edges rather than affirm them. It keeps your knowledge limber and resilient. So here's an exercise. What if you made a circle with 12 bowls to represent the 12 moon cycles of the year and you poured practically or mentally, um, another being stone, landscape, fungi, insect, particle into each of these bowls. So 12 different beings. What if for each moon cycle, 28 days of the year, you practice thinking, feeling, knowing like something else? For the first moon cycle, you researched willow trees. You read indigenous folklore about them. You sat with one near your home. You wrote poems about willows. You read scientific articles about their root systems, their evolution. What did willow co-evolve with? What ecosystem is it in relationship with? What does it mean to act like a willow, taste willow, keep a splinter of willow bark beneath your pillow? And then when the cycle ends, let willow have mixed with your materials, let it have changed you, given you new roots, honor the cycle and let it slide roboros like back into its own mouth, digesting its body, making its body into your body and then move into the next lunar bowl. What would it look like to track your year, not through milestones or colonizer or holidays? What would it look like to track your year through a practice of otherness, a, lunac a lunacy that doesn't drive you mad? It makes you more than human. Um, okay, so we're about to um, end this session, but we have about like five, 10 extra minutes. And if anyone has any questions or responses or anything, I would love to invite those in. I would actually love, thank you so much. That was just a beautiful hour and everybody who participated and shared something, but especially you, um, Sophie, that was, <laughs> it did a lot of good to my mind and soul. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I was wondering if we could, I already shared that question in the chat. It would be just amazing to um, know what your favorite stories are or what some books you would recommend are because um, uh, sometimes I don't know where to start or what what next book to grab onto so I would here, I would love to have some insights <laughs> Tips. so here are some non-fiction books that I think are really crucial amazing they're not more than non-fiction but they're great ways of looking so the human drops away very quickly in these stories. Um, and I think they're, they're, they're good to read. Um, and so I have so many recommendations, but these are just some of them very quickly. Of course, Sand Talk by Tyson Yunkaporta is also, I also think is 
what an amazing book about storytelling and myth. Um, um, yeah, there's just, there's so many. I would say that you can follow me on Instagram and I post recommendations all of the time. I'm always wanting to share and talk about what I read. And um, I'm also on Substack and Facebook and I have a website. I'm, I'm, I'm haunting the webs. You'll be able to find me. It will not be hard. And I give, I do try, I, one thing I want to say is I'm very inspired by fungi, which is they give without asking back, but they get a lot back, but they, they don't try and get it back immediately. So most of what I do is for free. But I have a book coming out of the next year, which is about rewilding myths with ecology, but I do offer a lot of writing for free because I think that's really important. And I'm a starving artist and I know that that is an important way of receiving information. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much. Is, does anyone else want to offer? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi, hi, Sophie. Hi. I'm just going to say a quick hi because it's uh, trying to not get my eyes to use the light. Uh, it's dark here in London, so I'm switching my video off. Mm -hmm. I have a practical question for you. I'm a big fan of your work, as you know. And so I fully agree that to get into this otherness and into these ecological stories, we need to slow down and we need to really spend time to get into these relationships. How do you navigate that alongside this extremely fast paced digital world where these kind of screens and cyber kinetic connections take us away from that so much? Like how do you practically navigate that? I would love to know. The answer is I don't. And I think it's a constant failure. And I think we're always trying to negotiate it. I do think that I'll never forget in an unbeing interview John O'Donohue did with Krista Tippett that I'm sure, you know, many of you have listened to. He talks, she says like, how do you access beauty if you're in a city and, and, and you're a foster kid and you're in a terrible situation? He says, look up at the sky. I do think that everything is nature, you know, I used, to, I used to give tarot readings and when people were obviously working all the time, like a single mom, telling people to carve out time for self-pleasure and care in their life was like pretty, like not the right thing to say. And as someone who is sick and works full time, like I get that that's like not the thing to say. So in terms of giving people practices and telling them how to do this, when you're sitting on the toilet bowl, notice the dust particles in the air. <laughs> You know, when, when, when you cook, notice the smells, maybe take a moment before you go to sleep and just feel all of the sense, like the touch receptors in your hands over your face. You are, you know, there's no divide between mind and matter. Like you are a landscape. You don't need to go to a landscape. You can be the landscape. And oftentimes we don't have the, um, the privilege to be able to go seek out somewhere beautiful. Sometimes it's just that little piece of blue sky through our bathroom window. Yeah, sometimes it's a stink of garbage. So, so I actually think it's about melting our, our ideas of what counts as awareness. Um, I don't know if that's a good answer. Yeah, we take, the, we, we grasp at those slender splinters of sensory information. Thank you, I love that. It's like the power of presence. Thank you so much, Ying. It's also really nice to officially meet you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, even though it's online, yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? I think we might have time for one more. Oh my gosh, yes. The General Ecologies podcast by Serpentine Galleries is one of the best thing ever. I will second that. Someone said that. Also, and mm -hmm. they worked in conjunction with Future Ecologies. That's also another amazing podcast. Yeah. This has been beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank it's you, everyone. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody, so, so much. Um, 
I will bring you with me into the rest of my day. We've all sedimented into each other. Sometimes I think like, you know, we're not together, but maybe like a photon of light that's moving from that window bounces through like the computer screen, activates all of these different things and does in fact haptically touch into your eye. Like yet there are so many different levels of translation, but it does happen. We're all kind of th by virtue of photons touching each other. So yeah, thank you everyone. Okay. Onwards to the next so session. Thank you. Thank you.